right. Morning, everyone. Let's open in prayer. Father, we count it a great privilege every Sunday that we can gather to worship you. I am thankful that the sermon follows communion. Our hearts have been stirred up, associated with what Christ has done for us, and now we can continue that worship as we are attentive to your word and the things that you want to say to us through it. And so we pray there be anticipation associated with what um, you want to reveal. That just use me as your vessel, Lord, to minister to your people. I know everyone's lives are busy. There's so much that could occupy our thoughts and uh, help us to have the self-control and diligence to be attentive to what you want to say and how you want to sanctify us through your word. And pray as we discuss wisdom this morning. You'll, you will be, while we're learning about it, also giving it to us and putting it in our minds, and we might better serve you. And if there's anything that's not in my notes that you'd have me share with your people, just bring that to mind, Lord. We do thank you for this time, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I appreciate Pastor Nathan preaching for me these last two Sundays. So he was supposed to preach for me one Sunday, and then he asked for that second Sunday, and it ended up being providential because last Sunday the smoke had been really bad for me on Saturday. By Saturday evening, I was really struggling. I didn't want to have to even um, come around you guys the way I was feeling. And so Nathan offered to do the communion. He was already preaching, but he did the communion too and the announcements. And so that was a blessing for me to be able to relax last Sunday. But I'm glad to be back. I missed you guys. I did want to briefly tell you about the first Sunday that I was gone. I think you know we went to a conference center, Twin Rocks. We were there with my, uh, the Malinowskis and the Coopers were there, and it was a real nice time with my family. We went there about two months ago, and when we were leave, we went there because they had this deal for kids where they said you could attend and your kids will be free. And I told Katie, well, you better contact them because they might expect people to come with like two or three kids, not eight kids, see if that's still free. And they said, yeah, we'd love to have you with all your kids. So we went about two months ago, and then we were leaving, and the kids said, oh, this is great. We really love to hear we ever gonna come back. And I said, I don't, I don't anticipate us coming back anytime in the near future. We just came because they were running this deal for us or for people. And so the, when we got home, the, ki- their, the conference center had sent an email and asked me to be the speaker for their Labor Day retreat. But they'd added something. They wanted my kids to do the music too. And so I always thought that'd be kind of nice if my kids could be part of uh, ministering with me where they would do the music and I did the speaking. But I kind of anticipated that being four or five years down the road, not like, you know, this time in their lives. And it was a little bit of a stretch for them and especially um, a lot fell on Ricky's shoulders. He had to be the guy that was up front, basically, because I don't do anything musically. And so he, I appreciated him stretching himself to do that. He did well, and, and um, the other kids did with their singing and rim, especially with the piano and ukulele. But anyway, when they first wrote and said, will you come, they, and they asked for the kids to leave the music, I went home and I told the kids, well, they haven't invited us to come back and for me to speak, but the, the catch is they also want you guys to do the music. And so it was a nice time as a family. I appreciate you guys letting me go there. There was one thing from the weekend that I wanted to share with you. When we were there, it became pretty evident there was a morning time of worship and an evening time of worship. And it was pretty evident that many of the people who were at the conference were not attending the worship times. For them, I think it was a little more of a kind of a just break or, you know, go someplace and have some prepare your meals and enjoy the, you know, beauty and the wildlife and so forth. And but they didn't really have any relationship with the Lord or interest in spiritual things. And so I came, come to find out that many of these people had attended because there was an older gentleman who had paid for all, for many years, paid for his kids and his grandkids to come. And many of those kids and grandkids were unbelievers. And they're practicing social distancing at the conference. And so I didn't, unlike many conferences, I didn't get to know people, didn't really get to talk with them. But you could kind of tell that many of these people were unbelievers. Well, this grandfather who paid for all of his family to attend had one request. He's in his 80s, and he said, I would like all of you to come and sing with me on the last night. And so when your 80-something-year-old grandfather or great-grandfather pays for you to come to a conference and then asks you to come sing a song with him, you do that. And so the last night, which is my last opportunity to speak to these people, they all came, and they all sang the song up front, and when I went up to speak, I could look out and see all the people that I had seen at the conference who had not come to any of the worship times. And I had told my family before I went up front, I said, there's a lot of unbelievers who are here that haven't been here for the other, for the other uh, worship times, so please be praying for them. When I finished, Landon and Rochelle said they had been praying the whole time I had been presenting the gospel. And so I kind of changed my message 
But it's just a real sweet blessing to be able to share the gospel. You know, I don't know what they thought when they were coming to that, but God providentially provided for them to be able to come and for me to share the gospel with them at the end. I was very thankful for that. And so thanks for supporting us being able to go away like that. And I just want you to be aware of some of the ministry that God, you know, is able to accomplish when I'm not here on Sunday. But I am glad to be back. So if you want to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings 3, that's where we're going to be at this morning. The title of this morning's sermon is Wisdom Is... <clears throat> wisdom is. This is a familiar account, one of the most memorable in the Old Testament. I'll go through the verses pretty quickly. They're self-explanatory, and again, I think you, you know them well, and then I'll draw out the application after we, after we get through the account. I want to begin by reminding you of something I've shared with you before that's worth repeating, that the Old Testament gives us examples. Romans 15, 4, whatever was written in former times, referring to the Old Testament, written for our instruction, 1 Corinthians 10, 6, these things in the Old Testament took place as examples for us. Verse 11, these things happened to Israel as an example written down for our instruction. You've heard me say that before, right? I was going over the sermon with Katie, and she said, you said that to them lots of times. Okay, I know I have. But it's important to consider that the Old Testament gives us examples, uh, often of New Testament teaching or truths. And so you'll hear something or you'll read something taught or commanded or revealed in the New Testament, and you'll see an illustration or example of it in the Old Testament. I mention that because that's very much what this chapter is. If you remember our last sermon, we were in James 1, and in James 1, 5, what does God say? If any of you lacks wisdom, go ahead and ask for it. And what do we see in this chapter? We see someone lacking wisdom, asking for it, and receiving it. We've also talked that God gives us wisdom not so that we can be prophets and know the future and be able to say why this happened or that happened or why God did this or why God did that, but he, we, he gives us wisdom so that we can do what? Navigate through, handle the curves of life, or navigate through trials. We also talked about how trials are tests, tests are trials. God gives us wisdom to pass those tests. Well, in the second half of this chapter, what do we see? After Solomon gets wisdom, he faces a test, and then he's able to use the wisdom he's received to navigate through that test. And so really, this chapter is a wonderful illustration of many of the things that we've talked about up to this point. So let me go through the verses quickly. Verse 5 is where we'll start. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. Now, without a doubt, this has got to be one of the most remarkable moments in the Old Testament. I can't think of anything else like it because we're familiar with it. We might tend to lose some of the significance of what we're actually reading, but for a moment, just consider what you read. The creator of all things, the God of heaven and earth, came to a flawed, sinful, weak man, and said what to him? Ask for whatever you want, and I shall give it to you. You shall have your, your whatever your heart desires um, will be granted. And so it truly is uh, remarkable. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this part of the sermon, but I do think it's worth us considering what we would say if we were asked that. There, whether sort of more a devotional thought for me this past week, as I was reflecting on these verses, putting myself in Solomon's place, I wondered how I would answer this. If God was to come to me and say, what is it that you want, Scott? You know, would, would I hopefully respond in a way that would be pleasing to God like, what, like Solomon was pleasing to God? I mean, that's what it says, the Solomon's answer, please the Lord. Would we be able to respond that way, or would we perhaps ask for something that's selfish or even worse, sinful? Solomon gives this wonderful answer, though. Look in the next verse. He said, you've shown great you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on the throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant, this is Solomon's way of referring to himself in the third person, he says, you have made me or made your servant king in place of David, my father although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to govern this, your people, your great people. If you remember a few chapters earlier, take your minds to the end of Second Samuel, I think it's chapter 24. Do you remember when David sinned by numbering the people? did that foolishly, God had to discipline him. 
At least one good thing we are able to take from that account is the number of the people, which gives us an estimate of the size of the nation at this time, and it was about four million people. Would have been an unbelievably difficult number for anyone to have to rule. I mean, especially in Solomon's day where he doesn't have some of the resources or tools <clears throat> we would have at our disposal, um, you know, to rule or govern a people. And so it was unbelievably intimidating for him. And so as he looks at what's before him, he says, it's too much, Lord, I need wisdom to be able to do this well. Verse 10, it says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none of so that none like you has been before you, and none, shall, none like you shall arise after you. Now, I want to explain something important that kind of this account, uh, confusion that this account introduces, and it's the belief that wisdom and knowledge are the same. Because of what transpired with Solomon, people tend to think that wisdom and knowledge are the same. Or what I mean by that is people tend to think that if they ask for wisdom, then they're going, to know, they're going to know a whole lot about a whole lot of things, like Solomon did. And that's a, that's a, that's a, a poor understanding, and it's going to lead to considerable disappointment if you think that asking for wisdom means you're suddenly being, going to become very intelligent about a vast, a vast many topics. That's not the case. The way to resolve this is to understand that God gave Solomon two things. It isn't, it isn't that clear, but that is the case that God gave Solomon wisdom and he also gave him knowledge. Look one chapter to the right with me in chapter 4. Look in verse 32. It says, Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Many of these proverbs are in the book of Proverbs, and so they contain wisdom. I'm sure many of the songs that he wrote also contained an amount of wisdom. So it wouldn't be too much to say that this verse is somewhat a record of the wisdom that Solomon had. But now look at the next verse. Verse 33, he spoke of trees from the cedar that's in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He also spoke of beasts, birds, reptiles, and fish. This is a record of the what that Solomon had. Knowledge, Knowledge exactly. And it's important to understand that knowledge and wisdom are not the same. If you if you want wisdom, you ask God. It's supernatural. I think our first sermon was in Job 28. Job looked everywhere and could not find wisdom in any of the uh, natural creation because wisdom is supernatural. It is from God. That you can't study hard enough. You can't, you can't get enough degrees to obtain wisdom. It is only something that is given supernaturally. Whereas knowledge, on the other hand, is something you can labor for, work hard enough. Knowledge is amoral. There's there's nothing wrong necessarily in growing in, wit, in knowledge unless, like 1 Corinthians 8 says, you allow it to puff you up. But knowledge is amoral. It deter, it's, it's an issue of how it's used. But you can work hard enough to receive it. You can read enough books to learn about beasts, birds, reptiles, and fish. But if you ask God for wisdom, don't expect to become knowledgeable about all these different topics. But because of this account, because God gave Solomon wisdom, and he also had, and God gave him knowledge, or he had knowledge of all these other things, people tend to associate these two together when there's considerable differences between them. Even listen to this. We read Ecclesiastes 12. You don't have to turn there, but one of the last verses, Ecclesiastes 12, 9, it says, besides being wise, the preacher referring to Solomon also taught the people knowledge. So it says, besides being wise, or in addition to being wise, he also taught knowledge because God had given him so much knowledge. And you need to understand this because when you do pray for wisdom, it doesn't mean God teaches you about um, trees and animals and so forth. Instead, he's going to help you figure out how to handle the circumstances or situations that you face. You might not gain any more knowledge at all when God gives you wisdom. And I mention this because this is largely what we see further illustrated in these verses. And this brings us to lesson one, wisdom is discerning what to do. Lesson one, wisdom is discerning what to do. <clears throat> I'll give you three examples of how this is revealed in these verses. Notice the repetition of the word discern. It occurs three times. In verse nine, it says, Solomon says, give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern 
between good and evil. In verse 11, he says, or God said to him, you've asked this, haven't asked for yourself long life, riches, death of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. And then in verse 12, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind. If you ask me for a synonym for wisdom, it wouldn't be knowledge. It would be discern. Discern and wisdom can almost be thought of synonymously because wisdom is basically being able to what? Discern what to do or discern what not to do. Second, at the end of verse 7, Solomon said, I don't know how to go out or come in. What is he saying there, basically? When he says, I don't know how to go out or come in, he's saying, I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom so that I know what to do. I mean, that's what wisdom is. It's not knowledge of something, but it is knowing how to go out or come in or knowing what to do or what not to do. If you look at the end of verse 9, Solomon said he wanted to be able, and this is important, <clears throat> he wanted to be able to discern between good and evil. And then at the end of verse 11, Solomon asked for understanding to discern what is right. If you remember early in the series, we talked about knowledge. Knowledge is amoral. It's an issue of what you do with it, whether it's used morally or immorally. But wisdom is moral. Any, knowledge, any wisdom that's received is given for moral reasons or to be used morally. And since wisdom is moral, it does exactly what these verses are saying. Or here's what I mean. Since wisdom is moral, it does exactly what Solomon asked to be able to, d- to do, to discern between good and evil. If you're given wisdom, you're able to discern between good and evil. Or in verse 11, God said that he asked for understanding so he could discern what is right. Well, that's what wisdom is. It's being able to discern between right and wrong. Now, you could listen to me say that, and you can say, well, that sounds odd. I'm surprised, Pastor Scott, that you're saying we need wisdom for that. Don't we just know what's right and wrong? We have consciences. Our consciences convict us. Our consciences do help us appreciate some things that are wrong in the language of Romans 2. Our conscience excuses us or tells us we can do something or accuses us, tells us we can't do something. But there's definitely an amount that without wisdom, we think is good when it's evil or we think it's evil when it's good, at least the natural man, apart from the wisdom God has given. What is, I mean, the world, the Bible says that people will say what is evil is good and what is good is evil. I mean, we see that today. Why do we see that? Why are there certain things that we know are evil that the world says are good or certain things that we know are, are evil, are good, that the world says are evil, except that there is an absence of wisdom or an absence of being able to discern what's right from wrong. Let me give you a couple examples from Scripture. In 1 Samuel, you remember the account when Saul was commanded to slaughter all the Amalekites? I mean, even that account alone <clears throat> is almost a picture of what we're discussing, because when Saul was commanded to exterminate all of the Amalekites, some people could look and say that that is evil. But God says it was good because he's punishing the wicked, he's being just, they had been given centuries, had not repented. The same thing with the Canaanites. When many people want to criticize Scripture, they'll pull out those accounts, the extermination of the Canaanites, the extermination of the Amalekites, to say that God is evil for commanding something like that. I mean, what's interesting about God's position is for those people that are uh, critics of his, he can't do anything right. Because some people would criticize, what, what is one of the criticisms of God? How could he let this happen? Why would he let people do that? Which really means, why hasn't he punished those people or stopped them, right? But what happens when God punishes those people? Then they criticize him for punishing people. So if God is just, people are angry. If he's not just yet, like he's still being patient or long-suffering, he just hasn't punished sin yet, then people are upset about that. No matter what God does, people are going to find reasons to criticize him. But God knows when people have been given enough time, and at that point, they need to be judged, and it is good for them to be judged. Saul didn't wipe out all the Amalekites. Samuel came, and perhaps to us, that doesn't even look like it was that bad of a thing. He lost the throne for it, though. It was that evil, you might say. But listen to what the prophet Samuel said to Saul when he was confronting him. 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Just one more time. Rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft. Arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Now, there's some things that we can appreciate are evil. We can look and say divination or witchcraft is evil. We can look and say idolatry is evil. 
But it might surprise us to see that God said what else is evil. He said rebellion is evil, and he said arrogance is evil. Some people, I mean, in our world, they're celebrated for being rebellious. It's almost something to be applauded. You're considered a somewhat heroic if you can be a rebellious person. What about arrogance? There's some individuals whose entire prominence is built simply on their boastfulness, their ability to stand before people and, and arrogantly proclaim the number of things they do. So the world doesn't look at arrogance as something evil. The, the world looks at it as something to commend and to put these people in positions of prominence and with everyone looking up to them and wanting to, to be like them. I mean, when was the last time someone became heroic in the culture because of their humility? But God looks and he says that arrogance is evil. He says it's like the evil of idolatry. And what's my point? My point is, it's only wisdom that allows people to discern between good and evil or right or wrong or see the sinfulness or wickedness of these things that the world can look on and applaud or think are commendable. Here's one other example, James 4. It talks about how foolish it is for us to talk about our plans. I mean, just consider this. I'm not, I don't have to um, worsen the strength, or I don't have to strengthen the verses more. I don't have to make this sound uh, stronger than it already does. James 4, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there in trade and make a profit. That's boasting, boasting about what we're going to do. And what does God say? In James 4, 16, he says, all such boasting is evil. Let me just ask you, do you think of boasting that way? Did you think that to say, I'm going to go do this tomorrow or this next week or this next year, that it's, that it's evil? Maybe you think it's uh, unwise or a little foolish because you don't know what you're going to get to do. But God looks and he says it's evil. The analogy I considered was sometimes with our children. I suspect we're not the only parents to experience this. Uh, you know, some children might tune in and could hopefully learn from this, or perhaps it's already happened in, they, in their homes and they've had to learn from it. Your parents don't like it when you come and tell them what you're going to do. I mean, when your children get older and they are, you know, adults or, or approaching adulthood and you've given your, there's an amount, you know, an, al uh, an allowance of freedom your children have to make decisions for themselves, you're fine with them letting you know what they're doing. But especially when your children are young, you don't like it when they come to you and tell you what they're going to do. You might, not, you might not even have a problem with what they want to do. You might even think it's a good thing for them to do. You just don't like them coming and telling you they're doing it. You prefer that they come and ask you if they can do it. Have your permission or approval for it first. And the reason I mention that is that seems to be the case with God. That's why God says that when people say, I'm going to go do this, 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 and this, that all such boasting is evil. Just as we don't want our children to tell us what they're doing, apparently, as God's children, He doesn't want us telling Him what we're doing. He wants us living in ways that are submitted to Him and His will, where we hold these things loosely, and we bring it before the Lord and, in a sense, seek His permission or his, his approval for it. So God tells us what we should do instead in James 4.14. 4, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, then we will live and do this or do that. And what's my point? My point is that's wisdom. God says what's evil, boasting about tomorrow, but wisdom is asking the Lord if this is what he would have us do, seeking his will for our lives, but you aren't going to recognize that without wisdom. You need the wisdom to be able to discern between good and evil. In verse 9, Solomon asked for an understanding mind, and in verse 11, God said that he asked for understanding. So twice, there's this <clears throat> emphasis on understanding. That word for understanding, it's shema. Maybe you've heard that word before, because that's the Hebrew word for hear, and the Hebrew daily confession of faith, which is to say the prayer of Orthodox Jews when they wake up each day, or perhaps even say it a few times per day, comes from Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And since it begins with the word hear, this prayer is called the Shema. Well, the reason I'm telling you this is when Solomon asked for an understanding mind, and God said that he asked for an understanding mind, that word for understanding is shema, or to hear. So when Solomon asked for wisdom, or he asked for an understanding mind, what was he actually asking for? He was asking for the ability to do what? 
well. Listen or hear. This brings us to lesson two. Wisdom is associated with listening. When Solomon asked for an understanding mind and God said he'd give him an understanding mind, he was asking for the ability to listen well or to hear all sides of an issue. And the reason that I said that this is interesting is because I'll just ask you, when you think of wisdom or you think of wise people, what do you typically think of? Maybe talking? Wise people say wise things, right? You might not associate wisdom with listening or hearing that much. One of the problems with this understanding is when Scripture talks about wisdom or when Scripture talks about wise people, what do wise people do, scripturally speaking? They listen. When Scripture talks about people who talk, especially people who talk too much, it doesn't call them wise or say that's a sign of wisdom. It says that they're what? So what's interest, it just occurred to me this week that we typically associate wisdom with talking or saying wise things, which is basically the opposite of how the Bible describes wisdom. So if you're looking for wise people, you're looking for people who listen well or, or hear, are able to hear all sides of an issue, especially before speaking. And just understand when the Bible talks about people who talk too much, it's generally talking about whether they're, they could be fools or it could just be a sign of foolishness. Let me give you a few examples. Proverbs 1.5, the wise hear and increase in learning. And this explains why wise people uh, are wise. They listen well and they're able to learn. Similarly, Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Wise people are wise because they listen well and they gain knowledge, they gain understanding. Proverbs 10, 8, the wise of heart will receive commandments, which is to say that they listen, but a babbling fool will come to ruin, whereas babbling or fools babble on or talk too much. Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. Whoever restrains his lips is prudent. So saying what needs to be said is important. God has given us mouths to communicate. There are verses about speaking uh, and even speaking wisdom. But saying too much is a sign of foolishness. Wise people, or it says prudent people, know when or know how to restrain their lips. Just do something for a moment. When you think about the times in your life that you have made a mistake or been wrong or even sinned because it says when words are many, transgression is not lacking, was it usually when you were listening or speaking? For me, it's when I was speaking. Rare is the time that I can look back and say, I really blew it then, I was listening. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. I really messed up in that moment. I was listening too well. For me, it's pretty much been when I was talking when I shouldn't have been. And that's what this is warning against. And generally, we're talking, at least when we're talking when we shouldn't, it's because we've lacked self-control, which is why wisdom is associated one of the signs of a wise person is someone who listens well, you know, it has required an amount of self-control on their part to be able to do that and not talk when they felt like it. Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth, get this, preserves his life. So it actually talks about being able to restrain our mouths being so important, it's associated with saving our lives. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. So that's how important it is that we control control our mouths that it can save our lives or even bring us to ruin or to destruction listen to these last two proverbs which are next to each other to contrast wise and wise and foolish people proverbs 17 27 whoever restrains his words or doesn't talk too much has knowledge and he who has a cool spirit which is to say remains calm listens exhibits self-control um, you know doesn't talk when they shouldn't or or doesn't respond angrily or harshly when they should be listening as a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. So even foolish people can look wise if they don't what? <laughs> if they don't talk. But the problem is they're generally too foolish. They end up speaking and then revealing to the people around them that they are in fact fools or that they're being foolish. But if they have the self-control to be quiet, they could keep that hidden or secret. The most well-known verse 
about listening and speaking, I don't even think it's in the book of Proverbs. It's in the New Testament, James 1, 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be, and there's three things commanded, be quick to hear, be slow to speak, so we should speak, but be slow to do so, and then we can get angry, but be slow to get anger, angry. And so one reason that it's important is it's just the issue of self-control. We want to do or say, we want to say certain things, the self-controlled or wise person can be restrained. So it's wise when we keep those things to ourselves that we shouldn't say, and it's foolish when we don't. So a question we can answer in the privacy of our own hearts, one I was reflecting on this week associated with wisdom is, do I talk too much? Or in conversations, am I the one typically speaking? Do I listen well? Do I interrupt people? Do I ask questions and encourage other people to share or talk? Um, do I ask questions that allow me to learn or to understand, or am I typically talking so much other people don't even have a chance to share? Briefly look back at verse 10, 1 Kings 3.10. It says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. This verse right here is the reason I wanted to dig into this passage. Just to be candid with you, I generally have a little bit more enthusiasm. I, I, I haven't really encountered a passage of Scripture that I haven't enjoyed. I mean, even when I've thought I'm not going to enjoy teaching this, I start studying it and digging into it, and then I get excited to share, to share it with you or with others. But with that said, there, what I generally find myself more excited to teach or preach on are passages or verses that I suspect lack some of the familiarity Aren't, aren't as familiar to all of you. And this is a, a passage that most of us are very familiar with. So there wasn't quite as much um, enthusiasm about teaching it, but then I looked at this verse and it struck me that Solomon's behavior pleased the Lord. And anytime we're reading through scripture and we see someone do something that pleases the Lord, we should tap the brakes, slow down, and ask ourselves what they did that pleased the Lord because it's a good example to us. I mean, we want to please the Lord too. So if we want to please the Lord and we see someone please the Lord, we should say, well, what did they do that pleased the Lord? And so that's what encouraged me to want to dig into this and consider what from Solomon's example we can learn to be pleasing to the Lord as well. And this brings us to lesson three. Wisdom is available to the humble. Wisdom is available to the humble. One of the things we see through this account is, with, is Solomon's with humility. <clears throat> I'm going to share something with you from, that I have some experience with. Just bear with me, and it'll relate to the uh, account. I'm not sure your familiarity with the military. Perhaps this is known to many of you. If it's not, then uh, allow it to be shared with those who don't have that familiarity. So there are two, sol two c categories of soldiers, broadly speaking, in the military, officers and enlisted or non-commissioned officers. And the lowest ranking officer, which would be a second lieutenant, outranks the highest ranking enlisted soldier or NCO or non-commissioned officer. So you could have like a command sergeant major who has reached the highest position he can as an NCO or non-commissioned officer, and the second lieutenant is still considered to outrank him. Do you see how this can create some fairly unique positions in the military? And so most second lieutenants, at least the ones who go through ROTC like I did, are commissioned the day they graduate, which means they're going to be in their early 20s. For me, I was 21 the day that I became a second lieutenant. So many, many second lieutenants receive their platoons, their, their platoon, not platoons, plural, but uh, you're, as a second lieutenant, you're going to be a platoon leader. You're going to receive a platoon that's filled with anywhere from 20 to 50 soldiers, many of them. And so in that platoon, here's what's particularly unique. Who's the most inexperienced person? The second lieutenant who just took over that platoon. Your right-hand person, if you're a second lieutenant, is, your, is the platoon sergeant, who hopefully will become like your best friend and biggest advocate. That individual, that man could have been in the military longer than you've been alive, <laughs> and you're in charge of him. And so when I was in RTC, they repeatedly told us these horror stories of second lieutenants who received their first platoon and I suppose wanting to show that they're in charge or, or reveal that they know that they, what they're doing. They sort of come on the scene and, and uh, act like they know everything. And generally, those are the second lieutenants who struggle the most and are the most disliked. And so they would tell us, when you receive your platoon, act like you don't know everything because everyone already knows you don't know anything. 
<laughs> Acknowledge your inexperience because everyone knows you don't have any experience. Be humble, be a learner, be teachable, strive to learn from your platoon sergeant and the other. So for example, I was an armor officer. So when I received my platoon, which had three or four tanks, I knew nothing about tanks. And some of these people had spent literally years of their lives on tanks. And then I had to be in command of that, of that platoon. And so they said, just let everyone know you, you're learning from them and that, you don't, that you're inexperienced. Well, the reason I'm mentioning this is when I read this account, that's the approach that I see Solomon take. I just see a godly man. I know there were times Solomon was very ungodly, but at this point in his life, he was still in the very godly category. This very godly man who comes on the scene, and how does he talk or act? Very humbly. He acknowledges his inexperience. He acknowledges his inadequacy, his need for help. What, here's something else that's interesting. Do you know how many older brothers Solomon had? At least three or four. So do you know what that means? Solomon probably expected to never become king. There were going to have to be a lot of deaths before he received the throne. And actually, there were quite a few deaths, right? I mean, if you're familiar with David's sin and God saying the sword will never depart from your house, that resulted in the death of some of his sins or some of his sons, Amnon, uh, obviously Absalom, Adonijah even ended up dying. But because Solomon did not know that he was going to receive the throne, it would have been a, a very shocking uh, experience for him to be told that he would be the next king. I mean, this fits with God's pattern. In the world, what is the picture of strength? I mean, it looks to the mistake that Samuel made. When Samuel went to anoint David, who did he think would be the, the next king, and who did he think would be the least likely to be the next king? He thought the oldest, Eliab. He says, oh, this, is, this must be the next king, David's oldest brother. David was not even invited to the anointing because the youngest is the sign of weakness. But because God chooses the weak over the strong, he takes Ephraim over Manasseh. He takes David over his brothers. He takes Jacob over Esau, and he takes Solomon over his brothers. And so in keeping with that, God chooses Solomon. But the fact is, Solomon must have received the throne. And so what does he say about himself? He says, I'm just what? I am a, I am a little child. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. It was, he didn't mean it that literally. He wasn't a child but he was probably in his early 20s. There's a possibility he was even in his late teens. God promised Solomon length of life if he obeyed. Because Solomon disobeyed, he did not get length of life. He died at a, just like his father, David. I mean, it looks like David lived the lives of multiple people because there's so much recorded about him and because he did so much. But David died at 70, which is fairly young in the Old Testament. I mean, you have some people living to 120. David's sin had taken a toll on him. He writes about, I think it's Psalm 32, he says he feels his bones, his body just aching, not from the battles he fought, but from the sin that he had committed. And it was the same with Solomon. His life came to an end at a young age. The reason I'm telling you that is for him to be king for 40 years and to die at a young age means that he received the throne when he was young, when he was inexperienced. But to Solomon's credit, he was willing to acknowledge that. He was willing to come before the Lord and say, I don't know how to do this. I need your help. I am inexperienced. I, I feel completely inadequate for this. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. I don't know what I'm doing. I am but a little child. I have to govern this huge people. And it's a very good example for us regarding how we should approach the Lord when we want wisdom. So when you go to the Lord and ask for wisdom, don't do it like this. Don't come and say something like, well, Lord, you know, I got it mostly figured out. I mostly know what I'm doing. You know, I pretty much got my act together. There's just this one little thing I need a little bit of your help with. Even if you don't help me, I'll probably be okay. Don't do that. Go to the Lord like Solomon did very open-handedly and say, and say, Lord, I am, I am unable to do this without you. I am completely at a loss. I am inexperienced. I will mess this up without your help. Please direct me. Please give me wisdom. That is the that is the attitude Solomon had that, that pleased God, and that is the attitude that if we have, I believe will please God and allow him to give us the wisdom that we desire. Notice three times in verses 7 and 8, Solomon referred to himself as your servant in verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant. 
king in place of David, my father. In verse 8, he says, your servant. And then in verse 9, he says, your servant. I draw attention to those three times that Solomon called himself God's servant because it shows, this isn't a trick question, that, God wanted, that Solomon wanted wisdom so he could do what? Serve God. That was it. And this, it's a good example for us. It brings us to lesson four. Wisdom is available for serving. <clears throat> wisdom is available for serving. That's why Solomon wanted wisdom, so he could serve the Lord well. One of the points, it's not said directly, but I think you see it indirectly, is that Solomon acted or responded to God very unselfishly in this account. God applauds him for not asking for things selfishly, like what? Fame, riches, death of his enemies, honor. Instead, he asked very unselfishly for wisdom. And even that, he, he could have asked for wisdom to be famous or to be rich. His wisdom actually did make him famous. Why did the Queen of Sheba come from the other side of the world to meet him? to hear his wisdom. His wisdom did spread far and wide and make him famous. You have enough wisdom does help people accumulate wealth, but that's not why Solomon asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom simply put so he could serve, so he could serve God well and so he could serve the people well. He wanted to govern them well, and this is why we should ask for wisdom, so we can do well the things that God wants us to do. My suspicion is if you come to God and you ask for wisdom so that you can, you know, play the stock market, (laughs) or you come to God and you ask for wisdom so that you can impress people and become famous, then don't expect God to give you the wisdom that you're asking for. But if you come to God because you want wisdom so that you can serve Him well, serve others well, lead your family well, raise your children well, handle this trial well, and by handle this trial well, I mean navigate through this trial in a way that glorifies and honors God, that would be a request for wisdom that I would expect God to answer. Now, follow me for a moment. I have said how 1 Kings 3 illustrates James 1.5. So James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God for wisdom and he'll give it. Solomon, so in 1 Kings 3, Solomon lacks wisdom, ask God for wisdom. God gives it to him liberally, super liberally or generously. It makes him the wisest man to ever live, second to Christ himself, right? So, 1 Kings 3 illustrates James 1.5. If you keep James in mind, there's some interesting parallelism that is important to us. I, do, I don't think this is at all coincidental or, or random that it's written this way. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. You go forward a few chapters to James 4.3, you don't have to turn there, but it says this, you ask and what? Do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so you can read James 1.5 and you can say, oh, it says here, if I ask, I'm going to get it. It does. But then you read a few chapters later and it also says you can ask and not get it. (laughs) And why would you not get it? Because you'd be asking for selfish reasons. And so we should consider, so if you were to ever ask and not receive, it would then be good to ask another question, which is, am I not receiving because I'm asking selfishly to spend it on my own passions? Now, because God told Solomon he would give him what he was asking for, I suspect that God would still have answered Solomon's request because he's not going to be a liar. But I also suspect that if Solomon had asked for something selfishly, we would not read in verse 10 that Solomon's request pleased the Lord. And so I think what we want are requests that please the Lord, where he can look and say, I am glad that so-and-so, that my son or my daughter has asked for this, for these unselfish reasons, to be my, to serve me well or to serve people well. Briefly look at verse 12. Behold, I now do according to your word. God says, behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. Notice it says, I give you. We've talked about this a few times. Wisdom is a supernatural gift, which is to say it can't be found in the natural world or natural realm, Job 28. That's why I began with that sermon. He couldn't find it anywhere. Wisdom is only something that can be given by God. Even if you're reading God's word, 
if you gain wisdom when you gain when you read god's word it's still because god gave it to you because i can tell you there are some people who read god's word and they do not gain wisdom i told you one time about a gentleman a, sci a science fiction writer isaac asimov and he wrote a commentary i mean a prolific writer it's just astounding the amount of material that this man could produce complete atheist i mean maybe agnostic but i'm pretty certain he was an atheist isaac asimov wrote commentaries on every single book of the bible what does that tell you it tells you that that man knew the bible well but considering he's an atheist he was also a man who had no wisdom because god says no matter how intelligent someone is or knowledgeable if they don't believe in him then what does the fool what does the fool you know the fool says in his heart that there is no god so that person is a fool regardless of how much how familiar he is with god's word you can memorize all the different accounts and still be a fool and so anytime anyone has wisdom it is because god gave it to them and god gave solomon wisdom but look what else he gave him verse 13 i give you also what you have not asked <clears throat> i'm going to give you riches and honor so that no other king shall compare with you with all your days if you write in your bible you can circle the words i give you also and you can write matthew 6 33. if you write in your bible circle the words i give you also and write matthew 6 33 which is where jesus said seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you i think we're looking at one of the best examples or maybe the best example in all of scripture of this verse because solomon made a request that put god first or that pleased god and then god did add all these other things to him god says you asked for this you put me first in seeking wisdom but i am going to give you all these other blessings that you didn't ask for and that's what jesus is saying now to be clear jesus is not saying put god first and you're going to be rich and have all your wildest dreams fulfilled but he is saying if you put me first i will make sure that you receive all the other blessings that i want you to have the main point of that verse is that we are to go through life and we're not to pursue those blessings we are to pursue god and allow him to give us those blessings as he sees fit and i'll be the first to say that i think god has given us many of those blessings so the point is pursue the lord don't let the worship him don't let those blessings become idols that we pursue in his place and then allow him in our pursuit of him to give us the blessings that he knows is best for us to have so solomon's request embodied solomon obviously didn't read matthew 6 33 but he did embody this kingdom ethic that jesus then preached to his disciples including all of us and this brings us to lesson five wisdom leads to other blessings <clears throat> wisdom leads to other blessings solomon pursued the lord or pursued wisdom and god gave him the other blessings that he didn't ask for as jesus talked about in matthew 6 33. go ahead and turn to proverbs 3. we won't turn back to first kings 3 until next week and i mention this because the book of proverbs actually you could say it like this first kings 3 is an example of what proverbs teaches will be the case <clears throat> or let me say it like this when you read the book of proverbs you basically see matthew 6 33 or you see that if you pursue wisdom or you put god first then you will receive other blessings as a result proverbs makes the point that if you pursue wisdom there are other blessings you will receive as a result that's what much of the book says now one of the most important things i mean even if there's only a few of you who have never heard this before to understand about the book it's worth saying to understand about the book of proverbs is this it is not filled with guarantees it is filled with generalities does that make sense there's a world of difference in other words proverbs records the way things generally work proverbs does not guarantee that this is the way things will always work and i'll give you at least i'll give you just one example of a proverb that has led to considerable hurt when this has not this truth has not been considered and i'll mention it because i think it can be familiar to all of us even if we haven't personally experienced it we've known people that have train up your child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it 
Is that generally the case? Is that a guarantee or is that generally the case? <laughs> that's generally the case. We know that's generally the case because you've heard me say that I've met parents. Many of them, I think, are better parents than me. Parents, I'd, I aspire to be like them. I would like to parent like them. I'd like to be as good of a father as some of these men. And generally, their children have grown to know the Lord, but then they might still have a child that rebels, right? Well, if they looked at Proverbs and saw it as a guarantee, they could feel very betrayed. They could feel very misled by God and say something like, well, you, you know, you said this. You said if I did this, then this. It's not a guarantee. It's not if you do this, then this is always going to happen. But generally, what is the case for parents that raise their children to know the Lord? Generally, those children come to know the Lord. Not always, but that's generally what you see, that the children of believing parents who have been raised to know the Lord come to know the Lord. And that's the case with all the Proverbs. There are Proverbs <clears throat> that discuss gaining wealth or long life, but it's not a guarantee that you're always going to have wealth or you're going to have a long life. But generally, people who live foolishly have shorter lives. <laughs> people who make foolish decisions their lives do come to an end earlier, and people who live wisely, avoiding certain things, sinful things, behaviors, actions, you know, there is benefit in that. There can be greater health or length of life from that, and that's applying the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. Okay, now with that in mind, go and look at me just at a few verses here that illustrate this. Proverbs 3, you have this father speaking to his son, and the father tells the son, if you do these things, you'll receive these blessings pretty much like we saw illustrated in 1 Kings 3, that Solomon pursued wisdom and then received these other blessings. Verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. In other words, receive wisdom, pursue wisdom, get my teaching, follow my commandments, gain wisdom. And then in verse 2, length of days, years of life, and peace they will add to you. So Solomon pursued wisdom, and God said he would receive length of life, at least if he obeyed. He didn't have the longer life because he did not obey. And right here, God says, pursue wisdom, and you will receive length of life. Look in verse 4. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Solomon pursued wisdom, and God said he would give him honor. And the father tells the son here that if he pursues wisdom, he'll also receive honor. There is an amount of honor that associates, that can be associated with wise people or growing in wisdom, gaining wisdom, does typically allow people to be better respected, at least within the Christian community. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Very familiar verses here. This is what wisdom does. It makes straight paths for us, and that it allows us to know what to do. So you're confused, you're not certain which direction to take. Gaining wisdom puts the path before you, so you know where to go, and you know where not to go. Proverbs 3, 9, look in verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, and then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. This isn't to guarantee that if you're wise or pursue wisdom that you're going to be rich, but people who are wise can generally accumulate more money then those who are foolish, because what happens with fools? What does it say? A fool and his are soon parted. So you want to see money lost super quickly, give it to a foolish person. Whether, they're, whether they just waste it, you know, on something they shouldn't, or whether they gamble it away, fools can't keep money. And the opposite is also true, that wise people are generally better with money or accumulating, accumulating money. To be wealthy or to be rich isn't, is not immoral. It is to generally make you more of what you are already because it gives you the resources you need to do the things you do, but in a greater capacity to be more generous or to serve more. And I want to be clear about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying by looking at these verses. I'm not saying that if we pursue wisdom or do what Matthew 6.33 says and seek God first, that we're guaranteed to get riches, long life, you know, honor, fame. But I am saying this. If we put God first, or seek first the kingdom of God, if we pursue wisdom, we are putting ourselves in the position to receive the other blessings that God wants us to have. How unfortunate is it to think that you have removed yourself 
from receiving the blessings that God wants you to have because of your foolish decisions. And that's just not something that I want to think about happening in my life, although I'm sure it probably has at times when I've been foolish. And so this is just to say that Solomon is a good example of pursuing God, putting him forth, putting him first, and then being in the position for God to add the other blessings that he wants someone to have. Now, I want to conclude with this. Katie was talking to me as we were going with a sermon, and she said that this account reminded her of, well, let me ask you, when you, when we, when you read these verses, especially verse 5, when God comes to Solomon and says, ask whatever you want and it'll be given to you, does any, does it, uh, any fictional account come to mind by chance or fictional story? Does anyone think of Aladdin or like the genie in the lamp? Isn't that kind of what comes to mind? And that's what Katie said. She said it reminds her of the genie in the bottle. Maybe you've even thought that as you've read these verses. And so in this, in this story, Aladdin goes into this booby trap cave, you know, and he gets a lamp, he rubs it, this genie comes out and says something pretty close to what God said. Ask what I shall give you. And the reason that I mention this isn't because I have any desire to talk about Aladdin, but because the world created this story because it is so fantastical. It, it is, it's so unimaginable that we would have any of our wishes granted. It, it's like every person's wildest dream to be able to make a wish of anything they want and have it, and have, you know, have it answered. And this account with Solomon you know, pretty much looks like this. Now, another conversation Katie and I were having the other day, I think it was this past week, and she said to me, doesn't all of this seem too good to be true? And I said, doesn't all what seem too good to be true? And she said, heaven, the forgiveness of our sins, eternity with the Lord, Jesus receiving the punishment that my sins deserve. And I thought, yeah, it does. I mean, there are definitely those times when I'm reflecting on all the blessings that are available to me in Christ, and they do seem to be too good to be true. I mean, if I think of everything that, I, that is given to me through the gospel, it, it really does seem too good to be true. And in some sense, as much as heaven seems too good to be true, hell seems almost too bad to be true. I believe both equally. But I guess my point is this. If God was to, if I was Solomon, or if some number of wishes were offered to me and I could have whatever I wanted, it's really hard to believe that I could come up with something that's greater than the offer that's already been made to me. It's really hard for me to believe that I could ask for something that would be greater than the invitation that's already been made to me. When I think about everything that is given to me through the gospel or through Christ, what more could I want? I can look forward to heaven with the Lord. I can look forward to, I mean, I've been sinful, but the punishment my sins deserve have been received by the sinless, perfect Son of God. I can look forward to no more suffering. I can look forward to all tears being wiped away. I mean, really, how could I improve on that? Or how, how could I say that that's not enough? Or how could I come up with something that would sound better to me? And so there is a sense in which, you know, I kind of look at this offer that's made to Solomon and say, that's the greatest offer that's ever been made. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say the greatest offer that's ever been made is the offer that's made through the gospel. As people invite us to repent, as God invites us to repent and put our faith in Christ. The gospel is the greatest offer made to anyone and it's made to us if we were repent of ours. I mean, what, what would you not like about the gospel? What fault could you find with it? What problem could you have with it? I suppose the only fault would be having to acknowledge that you're a sinner who needs a Savior. And for some people, that fault's too much. They can't do it. You, they're confronted with the gospel, and they can't look at all the blessings associated with it because they're just too proud. They say, I, I am not going to acknowledge that I am a sinner, I cannot acknowledge that I deserve hell, and I will not say that I need a Savior for my sins. And for those people, they reject that offer then. That's the fault that they find with it. That's why the offer is not great enough for them, because they're just too proud. And so, if we're speaking of wisdom, or we're, I guess you could say we're speaking of the opposite of it, people have to be very foolish to reject this offer. In fact, I would say that someone couldn't be 
a greater fool in any respect than to reject the than to reject the gospel and so don't be one of those fools if you sit here today and this is an invitation or an offer that you haven't responded to then i would consider it a privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you after service come forward let me pray with you let me answer any of the questions you have because truly the offer that was made to solomon pales in comparison to the offer that god makes through the gospel because of what his son jesus christ has done father we thank you for jesus and what's made available to us through his sacrifice we thank you for the gospel that our sins are imputed to christ and that his righteousness is imputed to us and that we can look forward to eternity with you we thank you for heaven and the reality of it and that we live uh, walking in faith but with that um, in light of that reality that eternity for us means being with you and so we thank thank you for that lord and help us to be mindful of that each day if there's anyone who hasn't who has rejected that offer we pray that you would soften their hearts grant them repentance and faith in christ and we pray these things in his name amen